Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. <laughs> we can let this go. I mean, no, it's, no, no. it's all good. My producer is going to love this. By the way, nobody send us a million dollars for that. That's not a real company. We just, <laughs> we just made it up here. Okay, I know it sounds good. All right, everyone calm down. Uh, in fact, you can steal that idea. It doesn't matter how good your product, your service, your idea, your company is. If you start that presentation from the low status position, you will not be listened to. What's up, guys? What an interesting interview with the author of a book called Pitch Anything, Mr. Oren Clough. And it's really intriguing what he has done as far as the neuroeconomics behind how we pitch things in our lives, whether it's to billion dollar companies as an entrepreneur or a startup or to your girlfriend or your wife or your husband or your boyfriend and where you're going to dinner that night. He's put a formula into not selling, but pitching different ideas. And there's so much value in this conversation. I really, really, truly think you guys will enjoy it. Here is that conversation, or at least the public section of the conversation. Again, guys, we are moving into a members content only area where the rest of these conversations are so powerful and so huge that you're not going to want to miss these. So you, you want to become a member of HXP. I'm still working on the setup for that. So stay tuned, but you're going to want to become a member. Otherwise, find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all at Human XP. Thank you guys so much for listening. We put so much effort and work into these shows. We love doing it. So hopefully see you on the members content side of this. Thanks, guys. The Human Experience is in session. My guest today is Mr. Oren Claff. Oren, thank you so much for your time and presence, sir. Welcome to HXP. Hey, for the three seconds I've been here, I'm happy to be here. Well, I mean, uh, the you know the history of of me finding you is pretty interesting. I talked to a friend of mine, and I was in the process of of pitching these these startups and I'm sure he'll be listening but he was just like you you've got to check out this guy named Oren Oren Claff and I'm like what are you ta- what are you talking about and he's like he he wrote this book called Pitch Anything you'll you'll love it you'll love it so I I dove into your material but for the people that don't know anything about you can you just kind of lay that out for us please well, let me see. Yeah, I mean, if we've got the the audio book is about six and a half hours, so let me read that to you now. Uh, if you have, <laughs> L- listen, listen. So the most of us aren't straight up and down attack dog salespeople. We're CEOs. We're engineers. We're salespeople, entrepreneurs. We're pitching a deal, and we don't like this sense of always be closing, selling, uh, asking people, begging people, being in the supplicant position, trying to close a deal from the low status, low power position. So what happens if we're just a regular, we're an engineer, we're a CEO, we're an entrepreneur, we wanna pitch ourselves authentically, but powerfully without selling, without feeling cheesy. That's very difficult to do. Uh, And pitch anything is a way to understand how the mind of the buyer works. So you're presenting your company, your deal, your product, your service, whatever it is. So it comfortably slips into the mind of the buyer. They feel good about it. You're not being cheesy. And it's a comfortable, fun, novel, interesting experience for everybody to meet you while you're selling your deal, whatever it is. And so as people have learned to do it the way I do it, uh, the the reputation is built. And uh, maybe half of Silicon Valley now pitches deals 
the pitch anything way because you don't feel cheesy. You don't feel like you're begging uh, and you're doing things the way humans actually like to work with each other. Maybe I would explain it that way. Okay. Let's, let's go back a little bit and dig into the pitch anything method. And you send out a lot of different emails about all of your different experiences in, in pitching all these different companies. It's very, very intriguing. So if you could just, just back up a little bit and give us the breadth of the, the pitch anything process, please. Yeah. So what, I mean, I would go back just one step from that. When you look online, most of the information online is sales or motivation or life coaching or uh, how to start a business are from marketers. They really haven't done anything or they've done it once. I've spent my life day after day on the phone or in boardrooms trying to get $10 million, $50 million, $70 million from banks from billionaires, from private equity funds, hedge funds, venture capital groups, companies. And so Pitch Anything is really about those experiences, having done that uh, a thousand times and being in a thousand pitches, raising a billion dollars in capital uh, and seeing a thousand pitches being given to me. And so it's born of experience, not ideas or reading a, a science journal on a Harvard Business Review and, and sort of thinking that's how the world works. Based on that, what I've learned is that it doesn't matter what you say as much what you say in a presentation is how you got to that presentation. By that, I mean, what is the status that you carry into a meeting, hmm. onto a call? It doesn't matter how good your product, your service, your idea, your company is. If you start that presentation from the low status position, you will not be listened to. People don't pay attention to those with low status. And if you're inexperienced, some people come in with low status and they lower it even further from there. So what can we do to A, preserve the little status we have and B, grow our status very quickly prior to even giving the information about what we have. That's one of the central questions around how to give good, great, amazing presentation. I, I love that because you're right. I mean, status, if you, just as an example, when we started this show, it was difficult to get big names on. It was difficult to get people to listen to what we're doing. Now it's extremely rare for someone to say no to, to being on the show after they see the numbers and the metrics and the people that we've had on. Just to, so it's a very status oriented thing. You also talk about frame control. How does how does a person work with frame control? Are you using NLP terms? Yeah, so here? Uh, first of Where all, does come now I get mad because we talked earlier. It's Thursday. It's not on Mondays. I'm nice on Thursdays kind of a dick. Uh, so, so NLP, let's just, if we can strike that from our vocabulary, it is not taught at any credentialed college, university, academic institution. It's not a real thing. You can't touch someone on their left shoulder, look up to the left and have them, you know, buy your service. There's just, NLP is not a thing. By contrast, you can look at something like EMDR, which is as, Obscure sounding as NLP, hmm. in which you yeah. move. Do you, do you know uh, EMDR? Yes. Yeah, yeah it's uh, the movement of your your eye movement to uh, evoke an emotional re response. So, Forgot what it means. So, yeah. so I, yeah, just in ten seconds or less, EMDR is the movement of the eyes, which releases your ability to access uh, emotional trauma that you yeah. might otherwise be blocking. Uh, look, I, I'm a mm -hmm. finance guy. Hocus pocus. It's not for me. But EMDR <laughs> is real. It's taught at Harvard University. You know, it's clinically validated. NLP, never yeah. been clinically validated. So anyway, um, the uh, – I'm sorry. We got lost down the NLP rat hole. But I think that's uh, – <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit delirious because I've been working pretty hard all week as well. So we can let this go. I mean, no, it's, no, no. it's all good. My producer is going to love this. So – Go ahead. Um, frames. Frames – are an abstract subject, uh, you know, in a, in a radio show and a podcast, but we'll try and get at them really quickly. Uh, okay. 
what I find in most presentations is that the call it an entrepreneur going to pitch a startup, right? He gives the information. It is a growing market of millennials who can't find the right kind of lunch and pet care. Therefore, we have a website that has pet care and lunch listings similar to Craigslist. We have 50,000 freemium users. Uh, here's what our key assumptions are. Here's who our team is. Here's who the competition is. Here's how the market we believe is growing. And here's the amount of capital we need to fund the startup. Very basic startup pitch, right? By the way, nobody send us a million dollars for that. That's not a real company. We just, <laughs> we just made it up here. Okay, I know it sounds good. Everyone calm down. Uh, in fact, you can steal that idea. So, but the problem is that doesn't have a narrative around it. It is just information and it allows the audience or the investor to frame the information in his own way, right? Because there's no ideas, it's just information. And so a frame is literally a window that you give the investor or the buyer or the other person you're uh, doing business with to see what you have. Because there are too many points of views too many angles, too many ways to assemble the information that you're giving that if you don't frame it, they'll interpret it in a way that you definitely don't want them to. And that's what selling is, is once somebody builds their own narrative and feeds it back to you about what you have, then you spend the rest of the time going, no, the way you see this is wrong. Here's how you should really see it. That way you would see value. So once you let somebody frame what you have in their own mind and in their own perspective, then you're spending the rest of the presentation trying to reframe it and bring them to your perspective. The job hmm. of you is to give the, the perspective that you want them to see your information at the beginning. That's framing. No business deal can be done unless two people on, on other sides of the table have the exact same point of view, right? If you think the price should be higher, they think the point should be lower, price should be lower, no deal can be done. If they think uh, the product is too slow, you think it's perfectly uh, suitable, no deal can be done. Until both sides have the same point of view, the same frame on the same information, can't do a deal. Your job is framing. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So what I saw from Pitch Anything was you call it the strong method, which I'm going to go through really fast, but you can do probably better than me, is setting the frame, telling the story, revealing the intrigue, offering the prize, nailing the hook point, getting the decision. We talked about moving into the pitch and setting the frame. How do we tell a story with what we have? Oh, okay. So setting the frame is really about building a narrative. All right. And I'll give you an example. Software company comes to me and they have a router that is for public services. So 911 plus works on it. Um, 911 emergency calls work on it. And it sort of routes emergency data. Right. And so they're. Um, the way they started the presentation is the way, you know, probably anybody has a software. We have a software system with 2 million lines of code. It's very effective at routing uh, data between government agencies, and it has a one millisecond, uh, you know, transmit time. The downtime uh, is less than one millisecond per 24 hours, and it is uh, cost effective for local agencies, uh, both fire, emergency, and police to implement and has uh, is an update from the existing aging system, right? So that's the basic pitch. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I got my hands on this, and I felt like the, there's no narrative, there's no story behind it. There's not nobody is getting into your swim lane and appreciating what's going on here. It's unframed, right? So this is how mm -hmm. I thought to do that exact same presentation today. If there's an unfortunate twist of fate in your life, a slip, a fall, a crash, or worse, your instincts will be to dial 911. The single action will put your fate in the hands of a Byzantine network of phone operators, private contractors, and public services. Good luck. 
Once you know how a 911 call is routed, you'll buckle up more often, wear better equipment for the sports you play, and generally live a more cautious life because a 911 response time can be 15 and a half minutes or more. Will you survive that? Maybe, probably, hopefully. But if you're disabled or critically injured, then seconds count. For this reason, it's possible that a 911 call will be the last call you ever make. But it's not just about personal injury. 911 is a serious problem for hospitals and emergency responders too. It costs them $8 billion a year in unnecessary readmissions. So that's my introduction for a soft company, You're good. right? I like yeah, it. Yeah. What is good. it doing? It's raising the stakes. Making right now we're out of software and we're into life and death, right? Now we're out of uh, unknown economics into eight billion dollars a year of unnecessary costs, and we're personalizing. It's not about five percent of the market or seven percent of the market. It's about you and what could happen to you in your life, and it 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 and it has a, a psychological realism. Right. And so a lot of things happening here in less than 160 words. That's proper framing. Hmm. So so a lot of this is really, you know, designing a story and the narrative, getting your frame right and and just having having a sense of of what you're doing, really. So uh, I, I might. Yes, I'm going to put it this way. Get when you start a presentation. Nobody is ready to get receive the uh, understand that customers you have and the number of lines of code and the uh, ROI on your product and uh, the value proposition. They're just all they're busy, right? They're thinking about their lo- their grocery list and laundry list and where they're going to go on vacation and which girlfriend they got to decide on and they're having a baby and what the baby's name going to be and the taxes are due, all that stuff, right? You have to get them into your swim lane with something new, interesting, novel, and and something they have not heard before, right? So the introduction... I, well, let's, yeah, go ahead. Let's, keep it, let's keep it interesting. So, you know, we're talking about specifics, but I, I kind of want to get a little bit more general with, you know, what you're doing. What's the, what's the biggest pitch you've ever done? Uh, so I'm working, if, I'm if working I'm on the honest. acquisition of a $23 billion uh, public company right now. Can you recall a moment where you were completely losing your mind right before a pitch? Can you share that story with us? Or do you usually have a good idea of what you're doing before you pitch? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a great topic. <laughs> what what I try and do, I mean, you always want to pee, right? <laughs> yeah. I treat these things as performances. It's not open mic night. It is... An audience has paid. They may not have paid money, but they paid with their time. The stakes are high. Right. You're trying to get something, and uh, and you're going to give a, a prepared presentation. So I view these as a performance. Whenever you're going to perform, you're always going to be a little, yeah. um, uh, you know, weirded out and wondering how how you're going to do. So I see. You know, I might see a thousand presentations a year. People come give it to me, and inside of our platform, uh, if you know, so if you go to pitchanything.com. You can submit a pitch, and I see a lot of presentations. And people hmm. just go and wing it, right? Because uh, they know the basic information about their company, the deal, the product, whatever. And so, so they go in and wing it. And for for me, when you wing it, a lot of bad things happen. But but basically, your presentation is a performance that you should know and be confident in the order of the things you're introducing, right? And so. The way you know you're giving a presentation, like mine, nobody interrupts, there's no questions being asked, nobody's looking at their phone, right? Because I'm giving a Mm -hmm. performance and people laugh. You have their attention. attention the whole time. Matter of fact, I've given presentations to boards asking for their business. At the end of the presentation, they've applauded, right? And then the head of the board comes up and goes, no, 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 no. We don't applaud our vendors, right? (laughs) <laughs> when they finish the presentation, we look at them very sternly and stoically like a garden gnomes, right? Those stone garden gnomes. And then we send them on their way and then we vote on them. And, you know, and then they go, no, but it was so good. Hey, Warren, can you do that again? We love that, right? So anyway, the point is I view these as a pitch as a performance that you're giving and something you have confidence in and you know is psychologically compelling. 
Soren, I mean, essentially we're all playing this sort of game, right? And in an idyllic sort of perfect world, all negotiations would be in a win-win sort of scenario. But we don't live in, in this utopia where everything everyone wins there is some there's a winner i and there's love a that notion oftentimes. you're one of the first people that has you know brought that to the table and they say it's just it's imperfect and these you know business deals somebody wins and somebody loses these are not win-win it is not the perfect mm. academic calculus transaction there's winners and losers in every deal they're imperfect so most of my listeners are probably not pitching billion dollar deals. So let's just let's just reduce this down to a, like the most yeah. common denominator thing that we possibly can, which is placing an, a Craigslist ad. Let's say that you want to sell your iPad and you know it's a used iPad, there's no scratches on the screen or anything like that. You've got the story down, which is you just don't use it anymore and you you want to get the most that you can out of it from the person that's going to be buying it and they want to pay the least for it. So, I mean, in, in that sense, how are you, you know, how is a person setting the frame there and in a relatable way? Because I, I don't think, sure. you know, most people are not so, going to. So there's all kinds of frames. I gave you some complex one, but the one I would go to is a time frame. That's a, a frame we all even have the basic lexicon or words around, right? We all say, hey, what's the time frame on this? So first of all, I would frame that in time with a time constraint. So there's one frame hmm. you can put on immediately. Okay. Okay. And what other types of frame frames are there? There's a power frame. So the moral right? authority and... frame. I don't know what the circumstances are of this iPad, but it was used in our church by the priest. Right. Five hmm. times. Interesting. Right. And then he asked us to sell it because he doesn't use it that much. So there's a moral authority frame where it implies that, you know, the priest of a congregation is not going to sell you something that's broken. So it's a moral authority yeah. frame. Right. And that's not, that's an extreme example, that. but it's an example of the moral authority frame. And, and so there's a moral authority frame. There's a time constraint frame. There's an intrigue frame. So a lot of this is just psychology. It's like, I mean, human, human psychology. You're kind of playing around with perception and, and human so psychology. So I think that's right. Uh, the thing is human psychology is expansive. And if you have to dip into the magic cauldron of human psychology for every deal, every transaction, you have too many tools. It's like, you know, a, a Home Depot full of tools and so frames are ones that are easy to understand, work every time, and you just uh, you, you, you can see them working and they're reliable. So, so for example, if you put a, a time frame on every single deal that you have, you will improve your conversion results or your sales results or your you know even if you're at home trying to pick a, a vacation right for your family and say, hey guys, we got to decide by the end of the weekend. Is it Hawaii or is it Colorado? The function of bringing a time frame to that negotiation will improve the decision results. Yeah, I think I think in pretty much any negotiation, adding time or adding a time equivalent is is going to change the the metrics of of what's happening in that situation. I want to talk about something that you talk a lot about in your in your emails and just what I've what I've read from you is getting past this sort of inbox, this very elusive, guarded uh, space that most people have. And I, I think I think my audience will connect with this is when they're pitching someone or when they're trying to get a hold of someone. It's it's like getting th past that that guardian yeah, so, gateway. So a couple you know, things. You know what I'm talking about? First of all, people have to recognize when you say, "Hey, I'm going to pitch." So give me an example of a of something that we're pitching and to who so we can just make this real. Okay, let's let's keep it simple and use myself and as, as an example. Let's say that I'm pitching someone to come onto the show. The first thing that I usually have my assistant do is 
bring up a contact email address. We've never we've never exchanged emails with this person before unless someone recommends them to us. So if we're reaching out to someone that we've never contacted before, there's there's a very elusive sort of guarded inbox that I think a lot of people kind of face. I mean, we get a lot of emails here at HXP. So how how do how do you get your pitch past the the this inbox? Three, three things. No, five things. No, wait, eleven things. <laughs> All right, let, 172 things to worry about. All right. Job one is to signal I'm not a robot. Because we all get marketing, and if it looks, we're all good at recognizing what is your robotic. So, job one is to have that thing scream, I'm not a robot, a real person at a company wrote this. Okay, job one. There's lots of ways to do that, starting with the subject, you know, through the first line. All right. Second thing is the email is not about you, it's about them. All right. Okay. Okay. You got me there. Can we talk a little bit more about that, please? Sure. Hey, Oren. So the subject is show. S-H-O-W, all lowercase. I have to open that because JP Morgan did not send me an email in lowercase that says show. (laughs) Some, either, either some robot malfunctioned or you sent it. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Second is, hey, Oren, followed what you've been uh, publishing for about two years, love the blog post on psychological realism and the video that you posted two weeks ago on X, Y, Z would love to attend the upcoming conference. You're going to be there. Not sure if I'll be in LA at the time, but hope you continue publishing the material. Hmm. Okay. I know that we have some sort of relationship Mm -hmm. that I may not be active in, but I'm not on a list because a list can't generate that. Okay. So making it about me lets me know that this is got some depth, right? The next thing is some social involvement. So if it's just you and I, I can bounce out of this email with no real consequences. You've done a good job because I've opened it. Mm-hmm. I know that you're a real person, and I know that um, this isn't just a marketing message. This is about something, right? But I can still delete that email really quickly. So what you're going to bring to bear is a third-party social relationship, which prevents me from ignoring you Hmm. for psychological reasons. My friend, you know, just as you mentioned, uh, referred me to you a couple months ago. He's a huge fan, you know, of the thousand people he's referred the book to, I'm one of them. You see how that prevents me from ignoring you? Yeah. And if you, by the way, if you CC the friend, right, that's even more brutal. (laughs) Or you say I BCC'd him, then I don't even know if it's BC, but I can't piss off a guy who's referred a thousand people to me. I have to respond to that. You're not a robot. It's a real email. Um, It's been about me. And there's a social connection. I have to respond to it. Boom. You're through the inbox. Done. Okay. Okay. So where, Oren, where do you see pitches fail, failing the most? What is the, what is the most common thing that you see people making mistakes when they're, when they're pitching someone, something, anything? So the, the biggest mistake is signaling that you don't actually have to pay attention to the pitch to get the information from it, right? Is you've either seen this pitch before, somebody's either seen the pitch before, it's extremely familiar, and they can guess what it is you're gonna say and the conclusion you're gonna make. So if it's not new, novel, and intriguing with things they haven't heard or know about, that's a huge mistake. If you need to give someone information, you put it in a FedEx package and you send it to them, right? That's what FedEx is for. To come to somebody's office and give them a presentation, if you signal to them they've already seen this presentation from another company or they can guess what the rest of it is or, mm. or a phone, you know, even if it's a phone call, they will check out and won't listen. So that's the number one problem I see is you can easily guess 
what this slide, what this topic, what this information is about, and that lets you tune out. All right. Hmm. So that's that's a huge problem that that most people step into. You know, we already talked about the lack of a narrative and just go, our company makes a uh, signal processor that is very effective for increasing bandwidth, you know, across uh, wireless networks. And some of our logos are Microsoft, IBM, Yahoo, and GE. Uh, and we're differentiated from the other products by the cost of our box and the speed of our signal, right? So that's the other thing we see, what it is, what the features are, and what the benefits are. So people do that in the first three to five minutes as the start of the presentation. That's it. Nobody needs to listen to you anymore. There's nothing, all they need to know at that point is price and then go to the internet and see if it's cheaper anywhere else, right? So without a narrative, just giving the features, the benefits and the differentiation, nobody else needs to hear, nobody needs to hear anything else. So starting out features, benefits, differentiation, logos, to me, is a huge mistake in a, in a business presentation. Just for the audience's sake, I, I just want to say that we're, there's, an, there's an iceberg and we're just, just touching the tip of this because you, know, you, t- you go into something called frame stacking and then hot cognitions. I mean, can you define what a hot cognition is? Well, I can also include that as part of the red flags or mis- you know, common mistakes that um, you know they see all the time. So another huge mistake, right? And this is part of, sort of hot, hot cognitions is using a presentation, right? Somebody comes to a slide deck, slides up on the screen, right? And and what I see most of the time is the slide goes up, the presenter looks at the slide and reads the audience the slide. And maybe that's the same thing on a Skype presentation or screen share or whatever, right? A pitch a sales presentation, telling somebody your ideas, no slides, get rid of all the slides, right? It needs, the slides are extremely distracting and they break the narrative. It should be you talking to the other people about what it is you have and you knowing what the problems they face are. So slides and reading slides are a huge problem, red flag, you know, as part of the mistakes. And so, you know, what is that? Putting up slides and reading them or reading about them to the audience is emotionless, right? It's so flat and two dimensional and doesn't carry any of the nuances and strengths and notions and color and ability and language and intrigue and interest we have as humans. Hmm. So a hot, so these are called, so when you tell somebody market size, KPIs, key assumptions, uh, um, ROI features, uh, the the list of features, competitive uh, benefits to the competition, these are all called cold cognitions. They require analysis by the mind of the other person. Whenever you put somebody into analysis mode, right, by doing math or by doing comparisons, making them think about engineering, right, you uh, – it's the term for it is called paradigmatic mode, mm-hmm. right? And when you – Put someone in an in, in analysis, cold analysis, paradigmatic mode, they, it becomes very difficult for them to make a decision to go with you because they're in analysis mode and they're going to have a question and more question. At the end of the presentation, you're going to say, so what do you think? And they're going to say, every single person that you put in analyst mode will say the same thing. This sounds very interesting. We definitely want to talk about it internally, learn a little bit more. Please give us the information. I'll take it up to committee or we'll meet with the partners or I'll meet um, with my staff and we'll get back to you if we have any additional questions. Mm, yeah. So if you put anybody into analytical mode, that's the only answer they will ever give you at the end of the presentation. We need to think about it. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those cold cognitions rely on analysis and math and numbers and, uh, um, you know, those, so, so hot cognitions are when you get people into an emotional mode and then look, it's no secret. Sales is about emotions, right? Mm -hmm. But pitching is a little bit different. One thing we didn't talk about is the difference between a sale and a pitch. Okay. Right. And so that's an important part of all of this is when you're selling, you have sort of have multiple bites at the apple, right? 
uh, when you, let's say you sell um, a paper like in the show The Office, right? So they call up and they say, hey, we want to bring you by some paper samples and they drop by the office. And what do you think? And we have this heavyweight and we have this new pink and this one doesn't jam. And the company goes, you know, we're kind of stocked up this year. This is all very interesting. Uh, why don't we try one ream through the copier and come back next quarter when we have more budget? OK. And so it's selling, right? You're building a relationship and you have multiple bites at the apple. You can come back, show different products. When you have something new, you can always come back in. It's selling. Mm -hmm. When you go to pitch, get a role in a movie, get a loan from a bank get some investment from a venture capital firm. Um, you know, in the, it, it's, there's one shot, right? And it's yes or no. You can't go to a bank and pitch a deal and then they go, listen, it's a no, but why don't you come back in a week or a couple weeks and let's take a look at the deal again. Maybe we'll like it then. That, since the beginning of time, has never happened, right? <laughs> when you go to a venture capital firm, they go, sorry, for us, it's a pass. They don't go, it's a kind of pass. Why don't you come back in a couple <laughs> weeks and take another look? Pass is a pass, right? <laughs> So yeah. even you're even you're laughing. Yeah. So when you're pitch, you have to you will get a yes or a no um, at, at that either a go forward or don't go forward at the end. So the stakes are higher. You know, Oren, it, it stick with me through the close here. But where you know where can people find your work? Pitch pitch anything. Where can people find? more about you is there are you doing any workshops or anything like that soon so great yeah so the easiest thing to do i think is go to pitchanything.com and sign up we'll send you some of my thoughts in email and you see if you love that stuff and you want to keep getting it which a lot of people do and then we'll say hey we got our workshop here why don't you go there usually they're in la or san diego but the place to start it's pitchanything.com. And of course, if for some reason you're the one person on earth left who hasn't read Pitch Anything, go, you know, find that and and read it. Um, so. <laughs> All right, man. I, I, I really enjoy the energy, man. I really enjoy the, uh, the playfulness and the openness of this, this interview and uh, your time and presence. The rest of this conversation will be posted in the members content area where we're curating the core meat of what we're talking about with these people and their secrets. And if you want those secrets, you're going to want to become a member. It's super worth every penny of that, I promise you. So get over to thehumanxp.com slash members. That will direct you into becoming a member and it will help support the show. You'll help us continue doing what we're doing. And if you, if you connect with what we're doing, then, you know, you should want to do that. Thank you guys so much for listening. And this is Xavier. We will see you guys next week.